Okay, you know. <laughs> Let's bring up our next storyteller. Uh, I saw her telling a story a couple of months ago. I was like, you gotta be in this show and put it together. So please, welcome Spell Anna. to the United States. In 1990, when I was three years old, my family, my sister, parents, grandmother, and I came to America as Soviet refugees. This was about seven years after Ronald Reagan's evil empire speech in which he told the National Evangelical Association that Soviets are, quote, the focus of all evil in the modern world, unquote. My family was granted asylum because we're Jewish, and that is the only group that the Soviets hated more than the Americans. Uh, at the time, we were called Soviet refugees, and the world was simple. About a year later, the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic became Ukraine, and four months after that, on Christmas Day, the hammer and sickle flag of the USSR was retired. There was no more Soviet Union and no more Soviet people. The great thing about being three years old when your entire life drastically changes forever, even if it's for the better, is that you don't really have to process it. When we left the Soviet Union, my sister was 12 years old and she had a part with lifelong friends. My grandmother lost her husband and had a heart attack three months before we left. And my parents were in their early 30s and they left their careers to take a chance in a country where they didn't speak the language and they were responsible for all of us. I was three years old. Uh, as long as there was one more meal and my mother didn't make my grades too tight, I was pretty okay. <laughs> My understanding of that time has started to solidify many years later. For one, I wasn't really aware of our economic status or lack thereof. Now I understand that not everyone has to wash and reuse the bought bags. But at the time, the only really tough thing in my life were the mean kids at the Hebrew Academy of Cleveland, my new Orthodox Jewish school. When we came to the US, uh, wealthy American Jews provided scholarship money for refugee kids in low-income areas to go to Hebrew private school to get us back on track after spending generations as heathens in the Soviet Union, deprived of the Torah and matzo ball soup. <laughs> I'm kidding, we still had matzo ball soup. <laughs> there wasn't any religion in, that the Soviet, in the Soviet Union in that the religious expression and practices were prohibited and that went for everyone. However, where Christians could become Gentiles and live out their Iron Curtain lives, Jews were still Jews. Jews were not seen as ethnically Soviet or ethnically a part of any of the republics that formed the Union. They were perpetual foreigners, <coughs> generations on the same land. Before I understood identity and history, I knew first and foremost that I was a Jew, because my mother told me so. Hers is a Judaism that is one of tradition, one that is salvaged from Soviet cleansing rather than being one of the Torah. It is one that is at best committed to community and at worst a bit insular. If you treat people like others for long enough, then after a while they become an us and everyone else becomes a them. Instead of biblical covenants, mine were to marry a nice Jewish man, preferably a doctor, and have a family, and to never get tattoos because then I couldn't be buried in a Jewish cemetery. <laughs> It was at the Hebrew Academy, though, that I first learned that I'm not actually Jewish, at least not in the ways that matter, I guess. I quickly got over being reprimanded by my teachers for having a short skirt, meaning the skirt fell above my knees, quite an inch, I guess, and that's a whole inch or state to slide right out of. In those years, what was hard, though, is I struggled to make friends, and I couldn't shake that pain so easily. While the wealthy Jews of America were welcoming us with their open wallets, it seemed that their children were not as excited to greet their foreign brothers and sisters. Most of the kids were terrible, but not like the leader, Ruchel, who was somehow lucky enough to be junior queen Hebrew while having cute, delicate Anglo features. I was rarely invited to play in their group, only during school season when half the class was absent. <laughs> <laughs> On one such occasion, though, Ruchel chose me to play house, and the premise was simple. I was going to be the mother, and Miriam, who was Ruchel's second in command, was going to be the father. And Ruchel was going to be her beautiful teenage daughter. <laughs> We each got to pick our names for our roles, and I chose Wilma because I had learned enough English to start to understand the cartoons that I watched. <laughs> and uh, I really liked the Flintstones. <laughs> we started to play, and I told Rochel that I am Wilma. That is not a Jewish name. You're not even Jewish. She screamed in my face and stormed off with Mary in tow. I can't say that this is why I left the Hebrew Academy, but after the school year ended, I didn't go back. 
and my parents were starting to get uncomfortable with my vaccination anyway. I forced everyone to pray before meals, or at least wait for me, while I slowly prayed in Hebrew. I refused to eat non-kosher meals until I finally gave in and did eat, hours later, having put everyone through the parade of being lectured about Judaic and God by someone who had not lost a baby tooth. <laughs> before and since the Hebrew Academy, Judaism in my family has meant trying to light candles during all Holy Night's Hanukkah and getting about five of them. <laughs> My parents took extra shifts at work and saved up enough money to buy a small house in South Euclid, a neighboring Cleveland suburb, where I would start public school in the first grade, ten minutes away from Cleveland Academy. A few years later, I finally got my mother to come to a parent-teacher conference. My parents didn't speak English well, and I was a good student, so they didn't understand why teachers insisted to meet us. Uh, they usually sat my older sister in their place. <laughs> at that point, we weren't really refugees anymore. I guess we are just immigrants. I still don't know exactly where the invisible line lies, but after enough time passes and you're not seeking refuge anymore, and your refugees continue to arrive, that label just doesn't fit anymore. At the start of the meeting, Mr. Harvey said to my mother, So, you're a Russian? No, said my mother. We not Russian. <laughs> I'm sorry, I mean, you speak Russian, you're from Ukraine, correct? You're Ukrainian? She looked very confused and said, no, we Jewish. <laughs> okay, but you're from Ukraine, right? Yes. So, you're Ukrainian? <laughs> Mr. Harvey's white eyes were those of a man who clearly regretted his topic of small talk. <laughs> so embarrassed that she couldn't understand him, and she was embarrassed that she couldn't get him to understand her. I leaned too close to my mother, and in Russian I whispered, Mama, here, there are two different things. Jewish is the religion, Ukraine is the country. You can be an American Jew, or a Ukrainian Jew, an Italian Jew. You get it? She looked at me for a second and shrugged. Okay, whatever, she said, in what was her most American moment. <laughs> that I was an immigrant instead of that I am one. Mm. But unlike the refugee label, I think that once you're an immigrant, you can never not be one again. My homeland, if you really want to call it that, doesn't exist anymore. And Ukraine wouldn't let me get dual citizenship when I applied a few years ago. The man on the phone told me I am not from Ukraine because I came to the U.S. before the end of the Republic. And after 27 years, I feel just like an American. But then my mother calls me. She's cooking and trying to follow a recipe, and she needs to know what lukewarm means. <laughs> and I'm snap back to reality. The reality that if she were here tonight to hear the story, she wouldn't understand any of it. The reality that I will never fit into any one of these groups, so maybe I just have to be the bridge between them. <laughs> <laughs>